Good morning, Our City Church. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, if you're new, uh, my name is Mike. I am not Pastor Chris. Um, a little different. Hey, I talked to him yesterday. He's out um, spending some really good quality time with his mom, doing some awesome stuff um, that is really taking care of her, which is amazing. And he goes, I only got one message to send to them is they better wear jerseys next weekend. And I said, I know, I know. All right, I'll make sure I let them know. Um, so I'm really glad you guys are here. Hey, um, since it's like, like my first time up here speaking, I just kind of want to take a moment to actually thank the team that like works with me um, and that I get to work alongside uh, week in and week out. So our tech team, our worship team, our production team um, is one of the best teams I've ever been a part of. You guys are awesome. You guys rock. Amazing. Uh, they put this thing like week in, week out, show up super early and make this thing happen. And um, it's just a really, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to work with them and alongside them. Um, like I said, my name is Mike. If you don't know me, um, I am married. Uh, I have a beautiful wife and a little baby girl. I got a picture of me and my family. There we are, looking awesome, cutting Christmas trees down in Texas. Of course, I have my Boston hat on because it's the best team in baseball. Um, that's Micaiah. I have another picture of my beautiful little girl. That smile. She wouldn't approve of any of the pictures, my wife that is, of the pictures that I wanted to show because she just uh, has big hair, don't care. So we call her Big Wave Dave, um, and it's awesome. So she's the, like the joy of my life. And um, so the awesome thing about this and why I'm showing you my family is because Tierney now is 12 weeks pregnant. And we get to make the announcement for the first time this weekend to our family. And I just want to tell all you guys because we're super excited and we're stoked for what that is. And so we got a new one on the way. And what it does is it reminds me of when Tierney was pregnant with Micaiah and the very first time what all that looked like and um, how awesome it was how nerve wracking it was and like this whole new parent, new dad and all the like exciting things that that can bring. But at the same time, all of the crazy worry and stress that that brings of like, hey, I can barely take care of myself, let alone another human. Like, what's this going to look like? And the whole process, I've had two birthdays now um, with a child. And when you celebrate your birthday, um, it just changes everything. You know what I mean? Like, you get to look at life differently. And I look at this little girl, and like, you're the best gift that's ever been given to me. And like, your heart's so full. And I was, I'm always taken back to like, how like Tierney delivered and what that whole thing was. And just a quick story, it was awesome. Because if you know us, um, we're just totally like kind of crazy, loud, and like real aggressive at certain times and like doing things. So Tierney was at the house laboring, and her water broke rushed her to the hospital. It was a stop and drop baby kind of moment. She only was in the hospital and pushed for 18 minutes and like Makai came out. And so to get her actually into the hospital, she was having real fast contractions and she wouldn't actually sit down in the wheelchair for me to get her up there. So I was like, hey, sit down. She's like, oh, I'm still having contractions. And like, I can't. And I didn't know what to do. So I was just like, yo, I'm going to just start ramming the back of her knees until she sits down. <laughs> So I finally got her with one of these numbers. It's like, you better sit down. And I'm going to handle the business. And so <laughs> just to picture that, I'm like, if we have to go through that again, she might get me with an elbow this time. I need to, like, get my guards up and start protecting myself. So this whole process, like, has been a lot of fun. And it's been great. And it's been amazing. And if you're a parent in the room, then you know the joy that it brings. And if you're not a parent in the room, then you uh, hear of all the parents that talk about it constantly of all the joy that it brings but what it does is it actually produces, it has an opportunity to produce, produce this anxiety inside of you. Like there's this pressure that comes with being a new parent. And you can read all the books you want, you can prepare all you want, but until you get your child, like it shows us that their brain develops 80% for the first three years. So I don't get 10 years to kind of figure it out. I get the first three to be like, oh, well, I'm gonna actually make the biggest impact in her life right here and now. She doesn't know the world outside of the world that I'm creating for her. And that's a heavy responsibility. So what we do is we kind of take that thing on a little bit with like being a parent. And you begin to, you have the joy and you have the beauty of the moment of like, man, like the birth and you just, the hooray, the, the balloons, the pictures, the everything. Like you can like bear the sleepless nights and all the above. But then there comes the moments to where the joy and the beauty and everything that your child you've ever wanted that brought to your heart, there comes the moments of you just start laboring. 
And you just start working, and you get tired, and now it's like that time has gone past. It's been months later and months later, and then you find yourself in different seasons where it can be not so much of a joy to actually parent your child, but then it becomes now a job. It becomes a task. It becomes now it's like really hard, and now it takes a lot of energy out of you. Same thing's true with our marriages sometimes. When we get, like, on our wedding day and we get married, the day is beautiful, and it's all amazing, and we understand love is not just a feeling, it's a commitment, and we get it all. It's not like it's something that we can't understand and cognitively connect to, but it's something that we're not emotionally going to adjust to the feelings of five years later when the marriage feels like it's just struggling and it's going through harder seasons, and now it's not the work of I'm enjoying this relationship, I'm enjoying what this thing has for me, but now it's becoming a task. Now it's this weight. Now it's like, man, I'm more committed than anything else in this. And it becomes this labor that we begin to walk around with. Same thing with our business. You can launch a business. It could be amazing. It could be doing great. And then you can have a hard year, hard, hard quarter, hard seasons around the corner. And then it becomes this labor. And it becomes this process where it gets a little bit more difficult. And today all I want to do is I want to see if we can open up this idea of this life-giving things that were given to us. These things, these gifts, our marriage, our kids, our family, our friends, our businesses, the things that we love and we care for, that we have an opportunity to actually enjoy what these are, but there's, there's, come, there's comes this time where we find this thing where it says, man, this work that I once enjoyed has now become a task and a stress. And that stress can actually respond to a, like an emotional feeling. And, and then what we do is we find ourselves in different ruts. And that rut can be like you get real moody. You know what I mean? Where like you're really hyper emotional and there's certain things that are going on that normally don't trigger you. But like someone else gets the spotlight or someone else is being talked about or someone else is being celebrated. And you get super upset. You may not respond to it, but deep within you kind of like become a hater and you're like, yeah, well, what about? And you want to pull up all the bad things that they're doing. You know what I mean? Like constructive criticism. Like people want to actually, like, actually help you and speak to you and actually start like, telling you some things. Hey, I think if you did this, it would be a little bit better. But the thing with laboring is this. When you're beginning to labor, what happens is your identity gets put into your works. So when someone speaks to your works and what you're doing, they're not actually talking to your actions. You feel like they're talking to your identity. So it feels like a personal attack and you get extremely defensive. And there's so much that can happen with all this. And we start going down this emotional roller coaster that we go up and down. And at the, at the point of all of it, it's not that we need to have a stronger emotional intelligence or we need to have a stronger mind or it's just a season. But at the end of it is really the, the crux and the foundation of what we find ourselves in is that at one point in our life, the thing that we are giving ourselves to, this job, the family, the relationship, the child, the whatever, it's, it lost its point of being a gift, and it's become a task. And in that season, it's really hard for us to begin to navigate the heart back to the point of what God has intended for us. And what I want to do this morning is I just want to pull up a passage in the, the very first book of the Bible in Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis 2, and I'm going to have it on the screen for us that don't have a Bible. And if you're new, I just want to let you know that you do not have to believe what we believe to be a part of what it is that we're talking about. And I don't even think that you need to even be a Jesus follower for you to begin to implement these principles and concepts to see if you can get some life out of it. And I'm hoping that today that we will be able to find some ideas that scripture speaks to that we will be able to open up our hearts to find the idea of how do I give myself and still work for the things and care for the things that are in my life and stay away from the, the concepts of stress and labor? How do I stay uh, uh, in the position of being a stress-free life? And in the beginning what we see is we see that God he created all the heavens and the earth. We see everything that he designed, and we actually see him begin to create structure and boundaries to things. I'm really bad at building stuff. Um, I don't know how Lowe's hired me to be an assemblyman. Um, so I was like, all right, if you want me to build it, I don't care who gets it, but it's probably not going to work at some point. Um, and so I used to build a bunch of stuff, and then my, my dad just bought um, a Kaya little like, playhouse. And I was like, oh, this is going to be dope. And then he brought it over, and I was like, oh, this is like a legit home. 
I was like, this is going to take us like eight hours to build this thing. So we're in the backyard all day, like every single screw possible is like drilling this thing together. And I was like, all right, let's like make it happen. And I'm so glad he was there because it actually is functioning and it works. Um, there was a moment I was in there like getting something um, like screwed together into the doorway and he dropped the roof on my head. <laughs> Never said sorry. He goes, hey, can you hand that back to me? I'm like, yeah, I guess. I mean, we got to finish, but be cool for a second and own that one. So, so there's, there's pretty much like there, there's this creation that's taking place, right? And like God is actually, he's, he's throwing the moon out there. He's creating the sun. He's creating the earth. He's got the stars in the sky. The ocean has a limit. The mountains are formed. We have plants, veget vegetation. We have animals. We have marine life. We have all this creation, and then we finally find ourselves. So now he creates his own masterpiece, and he creates mankind in his own image, in his own likeness. So now we just see that all of creation is, is started, and now he creates man. And we're going to pick up in the story where this thing leads off. And it starts with Genesis 2, starting with verse 15, says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. So the idea is this. There's two principles that I want to break down this morning, and I want to give us hopefully some hope and how we're able to actually function in some of these areas in our life so that we can enjoy the works that we begin to give ourselves. He says, work it and take care of it. The difference between working for something and laboring for something is the position and the posture of your heart. And so God created perfection in Eden and some of us have a really hard time understanding what that looks like because it seems like most of what we know and most of what our life has given us is a lot more torment and a lot more heartache and a lot more pain than anything else. So the idea of this eating, this perfection, and all you have to do is actually care for it, you'd have to think of if I can actually do something with my life that I'm super passionate about and I absolutely care about. Some of us have jobs that pay us well so that we can do what we love. That is a massive gift. That's an opportunity for you just to show up to work every single day and create and do all that. Some of us don't have that luxury and we have to go to work and we have to provide for our families and then we come home and then we have to create space for us to begin to create the things that we would like actually give us life and give us um, this enjoyment to what it is that we're doing. And so what we see is we see work and care for it. God has created environments and he designed something for us, for us to live in. That he says, I will take care of so many things, and whatever I bring into your life, I would ask that you would work for it. And what that looks like is this. Can you care for what I am surrounding you with? Can you care for the business that you're a part of? Can you care for your family that you're a part of? Can you care for your marriage that you said yes to? Can you care for the things that are around you? And when we step into laboring, what happens is the first thing to go is our care. The first thing that instantly leaves is not just this idea of like, oh, I got to keep on doing the work and I'm going to keep on putting the effort because most of the time the tasks are getting done, but there's no heart and there's no love behind it. Terry and I make the ultimate joke every single time we'll do anything and we'll just ask each other, hey, did you do that with love? So I'll be making a sandwich and if we're fighting, I definitely don't. I'm like putting my fingers into the bread and stuff. I'm like, mm, 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 enjoy this, yo. Not cutting the crust off. We don't do that. Um, but it's one of those things where you actually can, like, taste a difference or feel a difference when someone prepares something for you and they do it with heart. You know what I mean? Have you ever gotten a gift and it's one of those things where Christmas comes around the corner and there's just, like, a bunch of lists and you're like, here's the things that I want and you get everything on the list and you're like, oh, that was cool. Or you asked for nothing and there were some gifts that were given to you and you're like, dang, that was so thoughtful and so heart-filling. The difference isn't that you got an item and didn't get an item. The difference is the posture and the heart that it came from was I'm checking off the list. I'm just giving you whatever it is you asked for in comparison to I'm actually thinking of you and I considered you and I put thought into this. And this is, a, this is not just speaking of my time and energy. This is speaking of my heart for you. And so what God is actually showing us in the very beginning with just a man walking this earth, he's just showing us this, that when I set the stage of your life, and all of our worlds are created of something different. There are people that you love that I do not know. There are people that I love that you do not know. There are people that care for me and back and forth and all of the above to where our worlds have different circles. And in each, each of our worlds, we have an opportunity to care for and to work on the things that we are a part of so that we can find life and fulfillment. And so when we begin to give our hearts to them, 
there's this shift that happens, not just naturally, but spiritually. If you want to see a breakthrough, if you want to see something happen in your marriage, if you want to see something take place in your kid's life, then we have to step into the position of how do I not just respond to correcting my child's behavior? Not how do I just respond to my, my wife or my husband on how they're interacting with me right now? But once we get underneath that layer and we find that spiritual component of us and be like, how do I care for them right now? What's my daughter need right now? You know what's really weird is like there's this thing to where kids actually will shake their arms and it looks like they're throwing a tantrum and like, like about to hit something. And oftentimes it's because they're scared, not upset. And when I found that out, I thought my daughter was just getting real angry at things, but she was actually scared of a lot of things. So when we started speaking to her of her fear, and be like, hey, everything's safe here. You're totally fine. Get down to her level and talk to her eye to eye. And be like, what's bothering you? She began to articulate certain things. That behavior began to curve real fast. The tantrums begin to slow down. But now I'm not just responding to an emotional thing or this physical need that she has. I'm actually opening it up to be like, why is this happening? What's about this? I care for you. I don't just want you to act right. I want you to, I want you to feel right. I want you to be right. I want you to feel fulfilled. I want you to live a good life. And when we begin to take steps into that, labor and stress can start to peel back. And what happens is we begin to take less responsibility of the results of the person. And we start, we start taking more of the responsibility of our roles and what we're supposed to do in people's lives, which I'm going to care, support, and love, and allow God to do a good work in your life rather than me do the work for you. And it continues in verse 16, and he says this, because it's not just all roses. It's not just, oh, walk into the garden, it's all perfect and cool, and you just got to work for it and care for it, peace out, have a good week, let's go pats. It's not like that, <laughs> right? It's like he's about to say something that's going to change the game entirely, which makes this difficult and which actually introduces what real love is, which is free will, and the opportunity for us to decide what is right and what is wrong and for us to choose and to submit and say, I'm not going to dictate, I'm not going to determine, but I'm going to allow something else. And here comes the rule in verse 16. It says, God says this, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So if you know the story, it progresses into Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are, like, now Eve is pulling from the rib of man, and he created woman, and now they're walking around, and Adam walks, or Eve walks up to the tree, puts the tree down, starts eating the fruit, gives it to Adam, Adam eats the fruit, then they're instantly seen of ashamed and guilt, notice that they're naked, cover themselves up because they're ashamed, and then they begin to live different lives, and they're trying to hide from God in the garden. God, God communicates to them, gets into a conversation, and now what's happening is now they're going to be sent out of the garden so that they can begin to take the consequences they had, and then the next book of the Bible is seen of Exodus, and what we see is this. We see that God has created in the beginning this perfection paradise for us to live and function in. And out of our free will of him saying, you have one decision to make. Do not make this decision. And if you do, you will reap now what is death that you would bring into your own life, emotionally, physically, and all the above. And then we see now torment. We see pain. We see suffering. We see all the brokenness of humanity. And sometimes we can twist things up when we read scripture. Like, we know the chapters. We know chapter 3, 1. We know Revelations. We know Matthew. We know Old Testament, New Testament. And we know all these different stories that we've heard. And when we tell the story of Adam and Eve, we tell the whole collective story, but not just in its progression. And when you understand the progression, what you understand is this. You understand God created this. Man created this. So what's the design that we should have for our lives and for our marriages and for our families would be this. Lord, if I want to stay into a position of working for things, if I want to stay into a position of caring for things and giving my life to something, so I would have an opportunity to create an Eden for my family, for myself, and for people around me. What would happen is this. Lord, I'm going to allow you to determine what is good and evil. God, I'm going to allow you to speak into my life. I'm going to allow you to determine what this is. I'm not looking at my daughter and be like, she's scared. I know that because I'm brilliant. No, I'm looking at her like, what's wrong? I don't know what this thing is. And there has to be a thought to her. I'm like, I need to now ask and submit of me saying, I do not know. And I need something or someone to help me understand so I can actually give my daughter what it is that she would want. And for us in our soul, for us and the things that really matter to us, 
We would have to submit to something to say, I do not know. And that's the real problem. The real problem we have is that we feel like we have to decide. I have to be the best father for my daughter. I have to grow her and develop. I have to be the best husband for my wife. I have to be the best pastor for this church. I have to be the best everything that I have so that we would then accomplish what we want to accomplish. But the reality is this. That mentality and that emotional state says this. I decide. I need the wisdom. The curse of humanity is not eating a fruit. The curse of humanity is saying, I'm going to dictate what is wise and what is not. I'm going to take on the God attribute and say, this is knowledge, this is good, this is evil, and I now have the ability and the authority to do that. Rather than saying, Lord, you decide. You determine what is good and evil. You begin to speak to these things, and as you create that, I will respond and be obedient to what you would ask me to do. And in that response, when we begin to say, God, I'm going to allow you to decide, not everything will change around you. It's not that there's going to be no more pain. It's not that there's not going to be any more suffering. It's not that all the things are going to now get amazing and awesome and the results all turn into everything that you would want them to be. What it does is it changes not the external, but it changes the internal. You begin to live again. You begin to care again. You begin to feel again. You begin to take care of yourself. You start taking care of people. You start taking care of your priorities and your projects and the business. What would it look like for you to wake up and for you to like live a life that was like, man, there's something I do daily, there's something I do weekly that really takes care of who I am and I'm, I'm living a good life. There's a lot of hard things that happen around, but I, how I respond to that is good. I'm able to take care of people, and once you start living like this, you're able to start taking care of people around you really well. You don't just take care of people because you're just doing things for them, but it gets past the task. It gets past the art of just, like, what it is you're accomplishing. But now it gets into the thought of when people leave, and go, man, I always feel so encouraged when I'm around them. There's so much life when I'm around that person. There's some people I hang out with that I'm just like, woo, that was a task. That was not easy. That was work right there. I'm glad we kicked it, but, man, let's only spend a little bit of time with those people and then bounce. And there's some people I'm around, and I'm like, man, I'm probably making y'all work right now because this is great for me. You know what I mean? And we all have someone in our life that does that for us. And so what if a church all came together and started thinking about this idea of, like, man, not how do we just make people feel. How do we carry this principle and this concept within our own soul so that it's not just something that we talk about. And just always telling people, man, we just need to start caring for people. Don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. And we carry all the stress ourselves. You know the funny thing about this? I was stressed out about this message last night. (laughs) And I'm sitting there. I was reading it. I was like, man, what am I going to say tomorrow? This is crazy. I got all the notes right in front of me. But then I walked away and I was like, dude, the ultimate light bulb is like, enjoy your work. It's like, enjoy the things you get to do. Give your life to people. And there's, there's something that where this one principle is just kind of opened up to where I think that if we begin to implement this, I'm a person that's all about simplicity. If you complicate it, it's going to be too confusing to me. I don't want to implement it. And I'm just like, you know what? The best principle I pulled from Scripture is this, that God took 613 scribes of law and made them one. I was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I could do that. All that other, nope, I'm going to fail that one for sure. But one, I could do that. And so here's the idea that I want us to walk away with. My future self is my best self when I put God first. Your future self, and I don't mean five years from now. I mean tomorrow. I mean by this evening. I mean when you walk away from this and you go to lunch and you're going to lose your mind because someone's saying something or like starting to push your buttons and like that, that same like, situation is coming back up. And you're like, oh, or your kids are doing the thing that you just talked to them about and now they're doing it again. Or the business like partner is starting to make the decisions you obviously told them to not make. Whatever is now taking place, you get to look at that and begin, I need to respond differently to this. And the way that I can do that is this, Lord, how am I to respond to these situations in my life? It's not just some cute prayer. Prayer now doesn't just become about all the needs that you hear about. But prayer now becomes about, Lord, shape me and mold me into the man that I can be, into the woman that I can be. 
and it's different. And so what do you do? How do you go away with this? How do you implement this into your life? There's two real simple things you do. You create space where you feel like you don't have space. Because if you're like me, when you're stuck in laboring, then what you do is you cut all margin out. Because what stress does is stress takes all the mentality and all the emotions and cuts all of your margin and you're just worrying and you're freaking out and you're walking around like, I don't know how to do what it is that I need to do and you feel like you don't have enough time for the things that really matter to you. So one good thing that Tierney and I just started doing probably six months ago and I don't even know why we decided in the beginning to be honest, but we started to do this um, is I was like, look, Working out's a priority to me. Um, being healthy is a priority to me. Um, and then also, like, being, being healthy and active mentally, emotionally, physically. Those things matter. So I need to create space to read. Um, I need to create space so I can process emotionally. And then I need to create space so I can actually exercise and do something. So in the morning, I start my job at 9 o'clock. I can easily go to the gym from 7 to 8, go home, shower, and then get ready and be in work. No problem. Me and Tierney go to the gym at 5 o'clock in the morning. Not because that's the baby still sleeping and all the above, but we both go to the gym. So when we get home, we shower, we're ready. I'm ready for my day at 7 o'clock. I have two hours to really do whatever I want. I've, now what I've done in my day is I've created a two-hour block every single day to do anything that I would need to do that no one has any requirement for me as long as I wake up at a certain time. And when I do that, what I've found is I've lived such a healthier life mentally and emotionally to where I'm providing space where I can read, I can meditate, I can pray, I can process, I can write, I can take a nap if I want to, I can literally do anything that I want because I've created space in my life so that I can have margin to process through the things that I need to process through. I don't know, we might be different, but when I heard that my wife was pregnant, I wasn't first real excited. I was like, wait a second, that means everything's gonna change again? I remember the first year, you weren't that cool to hang out with all that much. <laughs> we turned the corner, thank God, but yeah, let's go. Come on. Let's, I'm excited for what we got right now. And when you see change is about to come, it doesn't automatically bring this excitement. What it does is it brings some worry, it brings some tension, and it brings some questions. And you, that's okay. We should never demonize that. We should never demonize the emotions that we feel. What we need to do is we need to create space. And if you don't have space to process through that, then what's going to happen is you're going to push that down, and then you're going to start functioning from that. Because then what happens is we have to decide how to handle that. If there's no space for you to process with God, how are you going to ever be like, God, how do I deal with this? How do I process? How am I supposed to do, like, live with this idea? What do you want me to do with this thought? Because it's real. Most of my thoughts aren't the thoughts that I want to have. Most of my emotions aren't the emotions that I want to have. What it is is it's me responding to the world that is around me and then saying, Lord, I have to step back and say, what do you want me to do with this? Is this right? Is this broken? Is this what you designed? Is this what you have for me? Is this how I'm supposed to live? Is there a better God in this world that I can begin to give myself to so I can find some reconciliation and some fulfillment? Can I get myself back into the Eden? Do I have to always be in Exodus? Is there something where I can find myself back into a promised land? Is there more hope in my marriage and in my kids and in my own self? Is there a better way that I can possibly live? And the only way I find that is if I create space. And the second thing is this, I can't do anything by myself because I get real discouraged, so I have to find myself in community constantly. And this is why we do life groups. And we're about to launch life groups, and you guys all got connection cards on the app and under, underneath your seats, or they're given to you when you walked in. And if you're interested in a life group, then I would heavily encourage you to check that box and get some more information on that, because this is what I found to be true. I have very few answers to the world that I live in. That is a stressful thought. But the only reason I could respond to working it out and caring for the things that are around me and within my life and trusting God through the whole process isn't by getting more answers. The reading list is too big and the things I gotta be great at is too large. I can't be all those things. But what I can do is I have faith and I have belief in one thing. God, I trust that you'll guide me through it all. God, I believe that you will direct me and you will guide me. I, I don't know about any of this stuff. I'm my daughter's too. I don't know what she's gonna be when she's five and I don't know how to parent a five-year-old. So if you got anyone that's five, talk to someone else. But a two-year-old, I know a little bit about. And I'm like, Lord, help me understand this phase of her life and let me provide something for her today. And then the next day, and the next day, 
in the next day. And Lord, get me around some other people that are doing the same that is I'm doing or just the next step ahead of me. Help provide a community of people that can support me and love me and care for me while I'm in this and keep on encouraging me to keep on going after it because I don't need a community of people to tell me what to do. I need a community of people to support me and I need a God to direct me and guide me. So as you would create space for yourself, as you would find yourself around a group of people that think like and have the same type of belief and you're in step with, then what you have an opportunity is you have an opportunity for you to actually create a bigger Eden for you. To get away from the exodus that we kind of find ourselves in, to get away from laboring like we find ourselves doing, to remember the moments of the wedding, to remember the moments of the birth, to remember the moments of why we started the business and why we're doing what we're doing, and to get excited again and to begin to create with passion and create with love and create with joy and to begin to live a full life and then our future selves have an opportunity to be our best selves because we're living not, we're not waiting for heaven so we can actually live full, but we're like, God, we're going to bring heaven down here so we can live full today that's the kingdom that's the gospel the good news doesn't just start when Jesus Christ walks the earth and accomplishes the cross the good news starts in Genesis 1 when he creates the world and Genesis 2 when he creates humanity when he creates us the good news says this that I will create for you good things and in that I just find so much hope I find so much hope for the heartache. I find so much hope for the pain. I find so much hope for the disappointment. And I find so much that I'm able to be like, man, I can make it. I can keep on going because God, I can't determine what this thing will be. But I'm gonna trust that you can.